Okay, how's it going everybody? So today we're going to read some more of um, <clears throat> the first European Revolution from 1776 to 1815 by Norman Hampson. So we finished chapter 3, the French Revolution and the European Reaction. Now we're going to read the Indian sum Summer of Enlightened Despotism, chapter number 4. This book was written, excuse me, this book was written, 1969, so yeah, this is from 1969. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and get into this. <clears throat> the Indian Summer of Enlightened Despotism. Insofar as one can distinguish between Napoleon's principles and the changing attitudes which he adopted for tactical reasons, his ideas tended to correspond, tended to, correspond to those of the Enlightenment. He himself said, quote, the more I read Voltaire, the better I like him. Up to the age of 16, I would have fought for Rosio against all the friends of Voltaire. Today, it is the opposite. Since I have seen the East, Rosio is repugnant to me. The wild man without morals is a dog. End quote. He took it for granted that government implied the solution of problems in terms of reason or common sense. Without regard to traditional rights and the practices of the past. In other words, it was a matter of scientific administration. Napoleon shared the Enlightenment's view of men as fundamentally similar, rational beings, and believed the science of government to be essentially the same from the Atlantic to the Urals, dreaming of the future unity of Europe. He assumed this would be based on, quote, one set of laws, one kind of opinion, one view, one interest, the interests of mankind, end quote. By interest, he meant the material interests of landowners or, mer or merchants, not the intangible claims of, or, of birth or prescription. Wherever he could, therefore, wherever he could, he therefore abolished traditional forms of government and society, which still bore the marks of their medieval ancestry, substituting interest for privilege and contract for hereditary dependence and protection. He wrote to his brother Jerome, when, whom he made king of Westphalia, the, quote, "The impatient desire of the German people is that talented men should have an equal right to your consideration and to office." which or not they are able they are of noble birth they want every kind of servitude and intermediate bond between the ruler and the lowest class of the people to be entirely abolished in quote in theory at last this implied economic this implied economic liberalism the recognition of the quote economic laws which regulated the satisfaction of the material interests of individuals and ensured that these convergent interests would contribute to the prosperity of society and the wealth of the state other factors, however, were superimposed on these basic attitudes. As a ruler, Napoleon's problems were different from those of the philosophers. His personal religious convictions seem to have fluctuated between a vague deism and the belief that, quote, man has been made from the earth, warmed by the sun, and bound together by an electric fluid, end quote. He shared Voltaire's opinion that religious belief, however unfounded, was the best safeguard of property, and the sage of Ferny would have approved of his disciples' credo. Quote, in religion, I see not the mystery of the Incarnation, but the mystery of the social order. It links the idea of equality with heaven, which prevents the rich from being massacred by the poor. End quote. Unlike Voltaire, Napoleon had to translate his religious policy into action. And so one tends to think of the former as the great enemy of the infame, and the latter as the man who restored Catholicism to France. Though, in fact, the two men shared a similar attitude. Napoleon was not merely a man who had to reckon with the political consequences of his ideas. Whether he liked it or not, he was also the heir to the revolution. The circumstances in which he came to power and the transformation of French society between 1789 and 1799 ensured that his reign would defer from those of the enlightened despots of the 18th century. Willy-nilly, he had to pay at least lip service to the principle of representative government and to make room for the elective process in his reorganization of France. Of more practical importance was the fact that the social and economic status quo, which was what men had in mind when they spoke of, quote, property, had been affected in many ways by the anti-feudal legislation of the preceding years and to a lesser degree by the proscription of emigres and the economic consequences of inflation. The, quote, interests which Napoleon respected as the natural foundations of the social order were often the product of the revolution. Napoleon soon became not merely the emperor of the French, but the overlord of a cosmopolitan empire. His principle of uniformity then conflicted with the tactical need to safeguard above all the prosperity and special interests of the French base on which the whole edifice rested. 
This was all the more important since his insecure position as a military usurper implied that his subjects would judge him by the same material standards which he himself applied to others. If interests were no longer satisfied, the dynasty had no reserves of traditional loyalty that it could rely on in an emergency. Napoleon never lost sight of his, this overriding need. However, it might conflict with the interests of his international order. He wrote to his son-in-law, Eugene, his viceroy in Italy, quote, My principle is France first. Italy must not separate her calculations from the prosperity of France. She must identify her interests with those of France, end quote. Finally, one must take account of Napoleon's own temperament and prejudices. <clears throat> his personal inclination towards the aristocracy and his respect for birth, which came steadily, more pronounced, will be discussed in the next chapter. Throughout his period of rule, he showed a marked addiction to the despotic authority, to the imposition of solutions by force, reinforced on occasion by the brutality of the successful warlord. Typical of his political cynicism was his remark that, quote, the constitution of a state must be created in such a way that it does not disturb the actions of a government, and so force, and so, and so force the government to violate it, end quote. His main concern was with authority. <clears throat> his educational principles although superficially akin to those of Robespierre and St. Ju Just in their emphasis on the mounting of minds, substituted obedience for virtu as the final goal. Quote, I felt bound to organize the education of the coming generation, and that in such a way that their political and moral opinions could be supervised. End quote. His religious policy was conceived not merely in terms of the social order, but also in accordance with his own political interests. Quote, 50 emigre bishops in England's pay are the present leaders of the French clergy. Their influence must be destroyed, and for this I have the authority of the Pope. End quote. The ruthlessness of his remark, quote, one does not govern men who do not believe in God, one shoots them, end quote, would have shocked even the most violent 18th century opponents of the philosophers. It is only in a restricted sense, therefore, that Napoleon could be considered the heir of enlightenment and to the French Revolution. He reduced the former from a philosophy of Bonheur, founded on a genuine, if sometimes misconceived, concern for humanity, to the mere pursuit of efficiency that the advantage of government. Efficiency was itself a, quote, bourgeois, end quote, objective, since it implied the disregard of prescriptive rights and the accumulation of economic power rather than the preservation of status and hereditary reign. In this sense, Napoleon's cons consolidation of some of the achievements of the revolution may legitimately be said to have given a bourgeois orientation to the French state. But it is important not to become the prisoner of one's own definitions and eventually assume them to apply more than one originally intended. The changing attitudes in French society were not the product of any significant shift in the balance of economic forces. The revolutionary and Napoleonic wars sheltered French industry from British competition, but at the price of denying it both imported raw materials and overseas markets. The virtually continuous warfare from 1792 to 1815 helped to distort French economic development. The pace of industrialization remained very slow, and those with capital to invest were more tempted by the attractive bargains in confiscated church lands than by speculation in history. The revolution, as Cobbin has shown, was of most benefit to landowners, who remained the dominant social class in Napoleonic France. Many of the wealthier landowners were nobles, who had either remained in France or returned to take advantage of Napoleon's amnesty, and succeeded in reconstituting their estates. Beyond the frontiers of France proper, the predominance of nobility was even more pronounced. The emperor's policies were not intended to accelerate social change. On the contrary, they aimed at aligning political influence with the social and economic status quo, and they supported specifically middle-class interests, only where the relations between masters and workmen were concerned. Nobles had nothing to fear and much to hope from the emperor provided they accepted his person and the ideology of interests on which his regime was based. They were expected to share with successful men of inferior birth the social prestige and professional advancement which had formerly been theirs alone and to accept some of the values that they had formerly scorned as those of rotiers, of roturiers. On these conditions, their social and to some extent their economic primacy in French society was secure for another generation at least. Moreover, aristocratic values had, however, theoretically rested on military virtues in the profession of arms. The interminable warfare of the Napoleonic period put a premium on, put a premium on distinction of this kind, and the self-made officer was more likely to aspire to promotion in the Legion of Honor than to seek to identify himself with merchants and professional men 
in a common front against the more blooded members of the officer's mess. The circumstances of Bonaparte's seizure of power in 1799 allowed him virtually to dictate the terms of the Constitution by which he was to rule as first consul. From the beginning, the concentration of effective power in his own hands was in, in a, ineffectually concealed by a Republican fig leaf. The first consul had a virtual monopoly of the executive power of the state, his two partners occupying a wholly subordinate position. The legislature was divided into three houses, of which the most important was the Senate. Senators were initially nominated for life by the three consuls, vacancies being filled by co-option. Universal suffrage was restored, but merely for the selection of a communal list of 10% of the electorate, judged suitable for local office. The communal electors then chose a department list of 10% of their own number, and the departmental electors chose a national list in the same proportion. The result was a final quota of 6,000 candidates for national office, from whom the Senate selected a, tri a tribunate which discussed legislation, and a legislative assembly, which voted without discussion. Subsequent alterations quickly removed such limited scope for opposition as the initial constitution had afforded. The tribunal was purged in 1802. Its powers were curtailed two years later, and it was abolished in 1807. When Napoleon declared himself emperor in 1804, he assumed the right to nominate senators from 1802 onwards. Electoral colleges were nominated for life, and the departmental colleges of 200 to 300 had to be chosen from among the 600 men in the department who paid the most direct taxation. Wealth was not quite synonymous with political influence, but the latter was made to depend on the former in accordance with Napoleon's conception of politics as the representation of interests. Major changes, such as the initial adoption of the Constitution, the life consulate of 1802, and the assumption of the imperial title, were consecrated by plebiscites, where few took the risk of declaring themselves in opposition to the regime, but many abstained. Other French institutions showed a similar preoccupation with authority. Local government was brought under the close control of Paris by the introduction of the perfect, the supreme executive agent in each department, who was chosen and closely supervised by the government. Mayors were also nominated by the emperor himself in the case of major towns and by the perfect in smaller localities. Local councils were elected for very long periods, 15 years in the case of the department and 20 in that of municipal councils. <coughs> They could only be selected from among the principal taxpayers. The result was to restore something of the oligarchy of notables that had administered pre-revolutionary France, the same family sometimes recovering its former influence. The election of judges introduced during the revolution was abolished. Judicial appointments were made for life, but the protection this might seem to offer to political opponents of the regime was curtailed by the frequent creation of special courts. It was eventually operated in 32 departments. The restoration of administrative arrests in 1810 even bought back the lettres de cachet. The regime, in fact, raced it on a basis of authority and compulsion, which varied in intensity from place to place and from year to year, but was always available for the rep repression of any opposition, which might arise. It was significant that escaping British prisoners of war had only to pretend to be deserters from the French army, to be assured of the sympathy, and sometimes the help of the civilian population. Napoleon's religious policy was typical of his approach to the problems of government. Its basis, as we have seen, rested on the social order rather than a principle, rather than on principle. It corresponded to his military needs, and it showed a readiness to come to terms with the existing realities. The first council can scarcely be blamed for his inability to end the schism of the French clergy by a negotiated agreement between constitutionnels and non jurors. Hatreds went too deep for that. Even when he fell back on papal authority to dictate a settlement, almost half of the non-juring bishops defied the Holy See and refused to accept the Concordat. The ensuing Petite Eglise, which claimed to be more Catholic than the Pope, still survives in a small number corner of western France. Napoleon obtained his settlement in the consolidation of his authority by a, cat by a catechism that preached the duty of unconditional obedience, but the long-term price was probably higher than he imagined. Deprived of its corporate, uh, corporate autonomy and, obedient fin and in independent finance, the old Gallican church had gone for good, exposed to communal pressure to behave as the moral gen gendarmerie of the regime. The bishops could only turn to Rome for support. The Concordat extended their influence by giving them the power to nominate their, their parochial clergy. With the religious revival of the 19th century, which Napoleon thought it expedient to encourage, the Concordat turned the relationship between church and state into an insoluble problem 
that was to plague French politics for generations to come. Where economic policy was concerned, Napoleon vacillated between liberalism and state intervention, designed to strengthen war industries or counteract the economic warfare waged by the British. Financial stability, stability was restored for the first time since 1791, and France was at last provided with a national bank. The free circulation of capital allowed anyone to invest in land, commerce, or manufacture. Official policy was to encourage rather than to direct. War contracting remained in private hands. Foreign trade and tariffs, however, were regulated in accordance with political rather than economic criteria. To some extent, this was beneficial to French industry, since Napoleon hoped to make France the industrial center of his empire and tried to impose a colonial economy on conquered territories, which were to supply raw materials and provide France with markets. Such gains were probably more than offset by the loss of overseas markets and raw materials and by the need to divert resources to the provision of substitutes for unobtainable colonial products. A few sectors of French industry prospered behind protective tariffs, but the Atlantic ports in particular, which had been developing very rapidly in the 18th century, were virtually ruined. French overseas trade was not to regain its pre-revolutionary level until 1830. Bearing in mind the importance of such trade for the launching of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, it is not surprising that the effect of the wars was to eliminate France as a serious commercial rival to Britain and to accentuate the relative importance of agriculture in the French economy. This is a factor to be borne in mind when the period is presented as some kind of victory for the French bourgeoisie. In education, as in local government, Napoleon consolidated and reoriented the confused innovations of the revolution in such a way as to provide France with institutions that have survived to the present day. In theory, the Imperial University, which with its monopoly of secondary and higher education, provided a single mold in which the leaders of the future would be formed. In practice, things were not quite so simple. The state lycees, with their severe reg regimentation and military discipline, attracted fewer students than the other secondary schools, some of which were private religious institutions. The universities had an undistinguished record during the Napoleonic period. Although the more technical Grandes Écoles provided France with able scientists and engineers, the history of the École Polytechnique illustrates some of the less fortunate characteristics of the Napoleonic educational system. Founded in 1794, the trained military and civil engineers, its students had originally been paid and many were the sons of artisans and peasants. In 1805, however, fees in the regions of £40 a year were introduced, although there were some free scholarships. The school was militarized by the introduction of uniform and drill, and the students accommodated in barracks. In 1811, they were deprived of their freedom to choose their career, the, be the better students being automatically drafted into the army. In other fields, careers were less open to talent than appeared at first sight. The scientists of European distinction who served Napoleon, men such as Berthelet, Monge, and Laplace, tended to form a pressure group whose protégés monopolized the position of power in the scientific establishment during the first half of the 19th century without producing work of comparable quality. Napoleon's neglect of primary education, which stemmed from his preoccupation with social order, possibly deprived France of the kind of men who had profited from the wider educational opportunities available between 1794 and 1799. Much of Napoleon's work was summed up in what he himself asserted to be his chief claim to fame, his codification of French law, especially the civil code for, or code Napoleon in whose drafting he took an act of part. The Napoleonic Code differed from the compilations of other enlightened despots, and that it was designed not so much to unify existing French practice as to provide a rational system of law based on universal principle, whose clarity and simplicity would make it universally relevant. In this, Napoleon, in this, Napoleon was certainly successful for the Code has remained the basis of subsequent French civil law and has been widely imitated, both in Europe and in the world at large. His achievement rested on the work of the revolutionaries who had overthrown so much that was the product of historical anomalies in the France of the ancient regime. The code took for granted the existence of a lay society. It was based on the existence of absolute property rights, as these had been established in France by the abolition of the last feudal servitudes. It also confirmed the abolition of guilds, which implied the prohibition of trade unions. In some respects, the code was a reactionary document by contemporary French standards, for example, in its reinforcement of paternal power and subordination of women. When it was applied, however, as Napoleon insisted that it must be, beyond the boundaries of France, its, its assumption of a lay state based on the legal equality of all citizens, 
instead of corresponding to an existing situation, implied, uh, implied a social revolution. The new order commended itself to wealthy communists, since it respected material property and disregarded social rank. In this respect, it was bourgeois in its social attitude, although the large-scale property owners were often nobles, whose interests it protected while it offended their susceptibilities. The issue was particularly serious where serfdom was concerned. Legal emancipation afforded small consolation to the serf if he had to pay for it by the loss of the land his ancestors had cultivated, over which he and his lord enjoyed complementary rights that no one had previously defined. Napoleon's contribution to the domestic history of France was therefore complex. Thanks to his 15 years of power, the revolutionary settlement was so consolidated that it was, it was to prove unshakable. At the same time, the emperor substituted the principle of authority for the goal of individual liberty, which the revolutionaries, despite their failures, had never wholly abandoned. Administration took the place of politics. Freedom of thought was more circumscribed than in, than in pre-revolutionary France. In this climate, science might prosper for a time, but literature wilted, and the most talented writers of the day, Chateaubriand and Madame d'Estaing, were hostile to the regime. Napoleon's restless and unfocused ambition involved France in a continual war. After years of glory and repeated victories, which were perhaps less appreciated by contemporaries, who had to pay for them in blood and money than by later generations. The emperor lost his adopted nation all the territory that the revolutionaries had won. In the process, however, he rewrote the map of Europe for a time and set in motion processes that were to continue long after his fall. As, a Napole as Napoleon's empire grew, territories on the borders of France were annexed. Piedmont, the Rhineland, western Italy, as far as south as far south as the, the Neapolitan frontier, Iuria, and the Dalmatian coast, and eventually the Netherlands, part of the Hanover, and a strip of North Germany that stretched to the Baltic. Several of the sister republics were therefore absorbed within the Grand Nation. This perhaps ensured the more effective introduction of French institutions, but the republics had already made considerable progress in this direction. On the whole, they had little to gain and more to lose from, incor from incorporation within France, which implied conscription and heavier taxation, and deprived local political leaders of such possibilities of independent action as the Directory had afforded them. Beyond the expanded frontiers of France proper, there came into being a number of satellite kingdoms ruled by members of Napoleon's family. The Netherlands, until their ne annexation in 1810, Westphalia, the Kingdom of Italy with Eugene as Napoleon's viceroy, Naples and Spain. Despite the emperor's insistence on the application of his code, with the secularization and anti-feudal legislation that it implied, in all the satellite kingdoms, conditions varied from one to another. The Bonapartes and their brother-in-law, Murat, were inclined to regard themselves as real kings rather than as French, pro French proconsuls. They tried to consolate local opinion, which in practice tended to mean the local nobles who graced their courts. Napoleon bullied them into conformity whenever he could and was perhaps preparing to annex the satellites when worsening relations with Russia after 1810 reduced his freedom of action. The situation was in any case artificial. Napoleon's own policy was intended not merely to introduce into the puppet states the social revolution that was now well established in France, but to exploit their human and economic resources in the French interests. Local men who were tempted to seize the opportunity of promoting social change as agents of France consequently discredited themselves by assuming responsibility for unpopular policies, where, as in Naples, Joseph Bonaparte and later Marat were attentive to local interests. Their reluctance to enforce a social revolution from above left many of the privileges of the local nobility intact. The satellite rulers each promulgated a constitution, sometimes drafted for them by Napoleon and invariably based on the French model. These constitutions, like that of France itself, were largely a matter of window dressing. Only in the Netherlands did a legislative assembly meet regularly and exercise any real power. Elsewhere, the assemblies were either not convened at all, or quickly replaced by nominated bodies, if they tried to assert their authority. Politically, <clears throat> the satellites were only, too obvious, were only too obviously extensions of Napoleonic France. Liable to annexation if the emperor prospered, and likely to disappear if the event of his defeat. They were pr probably most successful where, where local conditions were already favorable, as in the Netherlands and northern Italy. The history of Naples in the 19th century does not suggest that the Napoleonic experience had affected much of a social revolution there. After his victories over Austria in 1805 and Prussia in 1806, the emperor was able to overthrow the Holy Roman Empire and replace it by a new confederation of the Rhine. 
which eventually included all the smaller German states. His reorganization of Germany was to have deep and lasting effects, which merit examin examination in rather more detail. It is difficult for the modern reader to appreciate the almost total absence of national feeling in Germany, except with regard to German culture during the early Napoleonic period. When Beethoven decided not to dedicate the Orochia to Napoleon, what outraged him was the Corsician's assumption of the imperial title, not his German conquest. Even after the decisive French defeat at Leipzig in 1813, uh, Goethe insisted, as this G O E T H E, I think, is this Goth, Goth insisted on wearing the insignia of the Legion of Honor when receiving an Austrian field marshal who was billeted in his house, and Hegel's sympathies remained with Napoleon to the end. Rulers of the secondary states of South Germany, traditional allies of France, and opponents of the emperor won important accessions of territory from the breakups of the Holy Roman Empire. By the secularization of ecclesiastical estates and in the media, mediatization of free cities and imperial counts and knights, the latter were the main victims of the reorganization. Some of them found service with the remaining independent rulers in Stein, Metternich, Stadion, and Nesselrode, who were to hold high office in Austria, Prussia, and Russia, were all men of this rank. Their loss was the gain of states like Bavaria and Württemberg, whose rulers became kings and especially Abaden. It was not merely their territorial ambitions which encouraged the German rulers to take the side of Napoleon. The legacy of the French Revolution, once safely divorced from its original political content, had much to commend it to a reforming ruler like Maximilian Joseph of Bavaria and his chief minister, Mont Montgelas. Before 1800, they had already abolished purchase in the army and were struggling to bring some sort of order into a state whose different regions each had its own institutions, where government was impeded by the lack of any clear division of ministerial functions. The new constitution, introduced in 1808, can best be summarized in Montgelia's own words. Quote, It affords all the rights which the citizen of a state can reasonably wish. The abolition of all privileges, hereditary dignities, and corporations, it unites the whole kingdom in a single body judged by the same laws, regulated by the same principles, taxed on the same basis, on the principle that no one shall pay more than one-fifth of his income. Serfdom, where it still existed, is abolished. The nobility loses its exemptions and fiscal privileges and pays in the same proportion as other citizens. Nobles cannot claim the exclusive right to any office, dignity, etc. The law guarantees to all citizens the safety of person and property, freedom of conscience, and of the press, as defined by law, equal access to all offices, ranks, and benefices, a civil and criminal code that is the same for all. End quote. The extent to which the state gained in, in a in effective power can be seen by the fact that barbarian army increased from sixteen thousand to sixty two thousand within ten years. For the time being, admittedly admittedly, the troops were employed in the pursuit of French rather than barbarian policies, but this was not particularly new and in any case, the army would remain when the French emperor had gone. The new efficiency had been attained at minimal political cost. The king himself nominated the electors for life from among the most heavily taxed, an unnecessary precaution since the legislative assembly never met. It is scarcely surprising that minor German rulers, who had never enjoyed political independence and had been struggling with their aristocratic diets throughout the 18th century, should have welcomed the Confederation of the Rhine and remained loyal to Napoleon as long as it was safe to do so. In this way, the social innovations of the revolutionary France obtained a foothold east of the Rhine, very roughly as far as the division of Europe that emerged after 1945. The Grand Duchy of Warsaw, a revived Poland consisting mainly of territory formerly annexed by Prussia and ruled by the King of Saxony, extended French institutions in a somewhat attenuated form. Far to the east, in the case of Poland, however, social reform was less radical than that proposed during Kosciuszko's revolution of 1794. The estates of the church were not sold, and the extensive Jewish population was denied civil equality. Serfdom was abolished in theory, but was soon to return. The alternatives in Poland were to enlist a measure of local aristocratic support by limited concessions, to the nobility, or to undertake a major social revolution on behalf of the peasantry, which was unlikely to offer any positive, behalf, any positive advantage to France, and would unite Poland's neighbors against her. 
In a country so backwards, the application of the code was more likely to expropriate the peasantry than to modify social attitudes, which already corresponded to the distribution of economic power. At the opposite end of Europe, in Spain, the attempt to impose the rule of Napoleon's brother, Joseph, produced a civil war which the participation of a British regular army under Wellington prevented France from winning. The situation became extremely complicated. Large parts of the frontier area were under direct French military rule. Joseph, so far as his, as his writ ran, tried to apply the policies of Napoleonic Enlightenment with the help of the two of the ministers of a former ruler, Charles III. The Spanish resistance, which set up its own rival government, was divided between liberals who advocated similar policies, but with genuine representative institutions and a clerical aristocratic policy devoted to the restoration of the ancient regime. In Spain, as in other parts of Europe, actively engaged in war against France. The policies of the Enlightenment were discredited by their Napoleonic associations and patriotism, took on conservative colors. <clears throat> this had already proved the case in Britain from the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, and it was to become evident in Eastern Europe, especially after 1812. It was this sense, perhaps more than in a demonstration of nationalism, that the Spanish Revolt provided an example of the rest of Europe. In Eastern Europe, the three independent states, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, illustrate with significant local differences the general conflict between the imitation of French efficiency, which commended itself to governments, and the need for military resistance to French aggression, which implied enlisting support, the support of the nobles, who provided armies with their leaders. As usual, the Habsburgs, owning to the extent of their territories and the complexity of their interests, found it impossible to make any simple choice. Ever since the middle of the 18th century, Austrian rulers had been struggling to introduce what Napoleon himself described as new and bold ideas. In the face of stubborn opposition from the privileged classes, had Francis I been a minor German prince, he might have welcomed the opportunity to reorganize the state along barbarian lines. As Holy Roman Emperor, until he abandoned the title, the ruler of Belgium and Milan, he, he found himself waging continuous and unpopular war against French expansion. Dynastic necessity forced upon him a policy that implied dependence on noble support. Defeated time after time, it was desperation rather than a cool calculation of the odds that led the government, despite the opposition of the commander-in-chief, to modify its policy in 1809 and appeal for popular support in a war of national liberation in Germany. Despite the appeal to public opinion, what the Chancellor's stadium appears to have had in mind was the restoration of the old Reich. This naturally appealed to his fellow emigrant, Metternich, who denounced Napoleon's German allies as crown prefects. <clears throat> Responding rather reluctantly to pressure from the German Romantics, the Viennese government embarked on a policy of Volkish propaganda and somewhat relaxed its censorship of the press with a measure of success. The French Charge d'Affaires reported, quote, In 1805, the government wanted war, but the army and the people did not. In 1809, the government army and the people were all in favor of it. End quote. The army fought well at Aspen and Wagram, and there was a serious guerrilla movement in the Tyrol, which had been given to Bavaria and resented Montgela's secular policies. The response in the rest of Germany, however, was negligible. Bavaria and Württemberg fought on the French side, and the remaining states stayed neutral. There was no obvious reason why rulers or people should take up arms to restore a Reich, from whose destruction both had profited even for the Austrians themselves. The French victory was not without its compensations. It was only after the occupation of Vienna that, that they were allowed to read the works of Goth and Schiller. Once more defeated and deprived of territory, the Habsburgs returned to a purely dynastic policy, but henceforth they were unwilling to challenge Napoleon, and his marriage to Marie-Louis signified their reluctant and provisional acceptance of the status quo. Free to consult only their local interests, the Hohenzollerns kept Prussia neutral from 1795 to 1806. During this critical period, the state rested on the laurels that Frederick II had won, while its rulers secured such territories as came their way during the reorganization of Germany. A miscalculated attempt to acquire Hanover involved Frederick William III in war with France in 1806. The Prussian armies were routed at Jena in Auerstadt, and a state trained to obey and to leave all initiative to the government collapsed almost overnight. It was during the period of French occupation and Prussian alliance with Napoleon that a group of enlightened bureaucrats set about the renovation of the state along the lines that Napoleon had encouraged in central Germany. 
The intention of Hardenberg, and perhaps also of Stein, was not so much to transfer Hohenzollern despotism into constitutional monarchy, still less to effect a social revolution as to enforce efficiency from above. They hoped to break the immobile caste structure of Prussian society and to induce men of education and wealth to take more active part in the affairs of the state, without conceding to them effective control over major political decisions. Hardenberg declared his aim to be, quote, a revolution in the better sense, a revolution leading directly to the great goal, the elevation of humanity through the wisdom of those in, those in authority, and not through a violent impulsion from within or without, end quote. One of the intentions of the reformers, especially of those in the army, was to prepare Prussia for a resumption of the fight against France. Nice, nice now wrote, for example, the revolution has activated the whole national power of the French people, has transformed, let me start this again, quote, the revolution has activated the whole national power of the French people, has transformed the living force of men and the dead force of property into a rapidly profit-bearing capital, and has thereby destroyed the former stable relations among states. If the other states wish to restore the equilibrium, they have to open up and exploit the same resources. Nevertheless, it was Napoleon who recommended Stein to Frederick William III, and most of the modernization of Prussia was in fact achieved while the country was neutral, or in nominal alliance with France. A contemporary noted, quote, It is undeniable that the latest development in Germany's destiny is, on the whole, the happiest one could imagine in a situation of this kind. Her defeat has been the means of her participation in the French Revolution and in all the progress that the revolution has brought to the organization and administration of the state. End quote. The outbreak of fighting between Prussia and France in 1813 saw the revival of the eventual triumph of the opponents of Stein and Hardenberg. The reform program itself was similar to that already implemented in central Germany. It aimed to, the, to substitute material interests for hereditary privilege as the basis of the social order. All men became free to buy and sell land. Guilds were abolished and so was serfdom. Though the peasant had to surrender up... That right. Guilds were abolished and so was serfdom. Though the peasant had to surrender up to half the land he cultivated in compensation to his lord. Self-government was introduced at the municipal level, and the central government was recognized so that ministers, each henceforth in charge of a specific department, became the main political agents of the state. This was as much as could be achieved against a vigorous aristocratic opposition. The king depended on his army and its noble officers, if he were eventually to challenge Napoleon, and himself, a partial and reluctant convert to the new doctrines of national efficiency gave his reforming ministers increasingly tepid support. Hardenberg's position was extraordinarily similar to that of Cologne in France in 1787. In 1811, he announced his intention to tax all land and to create new prov provincial diets. When the nobility insisted that any new taxation must be approved by the existing diets, which they controlled, Hardenberg convened a special meeting of notables, who refused to consider new taxation unless they were allowed to scrutinize the budget. The difference between France and Prussia was that in the latter, real power rested with the nobility, and there was to be no popular sequel to the aristocratic revolt. York, the, the, the aristocratic revolt is in quotes here. York, the officer whose obedience of orders brought Prussia into the war against Napoleon in 1813, had rejoiced when Stein was disgraced. Quote, so one of these madmen has been eliminated. The rest of his brood of vipers will perish of their own venom, end quote. Marwitz, one of the leading spokesmen of the nobles, took his stand firmly on the traditional conception of a hierarchical society. Quote, Let us not forget that the will of the nation cannot be determined by the majority of heads of, or opinions. By the majority of heads or opinions. Patriotism can be aroused only by conceding to every estate its own interests. That is, by allowing multiple interests to speak out in a state. End quote. It was understandable that Marwitz should dream the centralizing Hardenberg for being Quote, like all the regenerators of our time, each in his own way a true copy of the great regenerator whom at their hearts they all worship. End quote. To some extent, the Junkers were fighting for their own material interests. But when they demanded representative government based on traditional local diets, they could claim to be opposing the bureaucratic absolutism of the Napoleonic Enlightenment. 
in the name of the principles of Montesquieu and Burke. In Russia, the foreign origin of the new ideas was even more evident. In the late 18th century, attempts were increasingly made to distinguish traditional Russian values from the massive Western importation since the reign of Peter, which Russian writers were inclined to identify with political absolutism. The young Tsar, Alexander I, when he came to the throne in 1801, surrounded himself with an informal group of advisors, including Stroganov, whose former tutor, Rome, had played in an active part in the French Revolution. Their proposals, however, had very little practical effort. A more serious attempt at reform was made after the Til Tilsit Agreement of 1807, when Russia and France were in virtual partnership. Alexander's main advisor was now Speransky, who, as a former lecturer of the Gart, Locke, Leibniz, Condillac, and Kant, was well acquainted with the theoretical basis of the Enlightenment. Speransky's views, as his enemies emphasized as at every opportunity, were very similar to those of Napoleon. Both he and Alexander regarded a constitution as implying orderly administration and the rule of law, rather than representative government. Speransky's draft constitution of 1809 provided for a legislative assembly elected for life, with power to impeach ministers, but not to initiate legislation. He hoped to restore financial solvency by the taxation of the nobility. He introduced a new legal code, which owed more to the Code Napoleon than to, than to Russian practice. His economic theories were in the best liberal tradition. Quote, the rule is now accepted that need and private interest can direct human activity and industry and the economy better than all government measures. Therefore, the government should be only a spectator of private efforts in this field. It should have accurate information on these efforts. And without restricting them by any kind of direct control, remove from their path all obstacles which might stop them. End quote. Very little, in fact, was achieved. Alexander was as delighted to plan as he was reluctant to act. He had always he had always to consider the strength of native opposition. Speransky was attacked as a Francophile by extreme opponents of Napoleon, such as the representative of the exiled French king and de Maistre, a fanatical enemy of the Enlightenment. He was disliked by many Russian nobles who saw bureaucratic absolutism as the barrier to their own political influence. Rostopchin, the man who probably ordered Moscow to be set on fire in 1812, denounced him as the most dangerous of the Russian Jacobins. The Tsar's sister commissioned the historian Kara Karamzin to write a pamphlet calling for a renewal of the traditional alliance between ruler and nobility and denouncing bureaucrats and those who <coughs> imitated foreigners. The Tsar, against his own inclination, disgraced Peransky. In March of 1812, presumably in the hope of winning aristocratic support for the war against France, which was visibly impending. As a general rule, therefore, the last period of enlightened despotism coincided with the apogee of the Napoleonic Empire. The Napoleonic version of the Enlightenment was attractive to governments, to whom it promised maximum efficiency at minimum political cost. It was opposed by the nobility, especially the nobility of Eastern Europe, since it challenged their social status as a separate order of society and their claim as a corporate order to a share in political power, even though it respected their property rights and claimed to consideration as great landowners. As the final military trial of strength approached in 1812, the rulers of the independent states were forced back into a closer alliance with the nobles on whose support they depended for victory. On the outcome of the struggle depended both the ideological orientation and the political geography, geography of Europe. Okay. So that was, uh, that was uh, chapter four. The uh, Indian Summer of the Light and Despotism. I believe is what it's called. Go back and see here. Yeah, the Indian Summer of Enlightened Despotism. It's basically about Napoleon, you know, and the reaction. So um, the fifth here is the victory of reaction. That's the fifth chapter that we will be reading next. It may be our last chapter. I have to see here. Yeah, this is the last chapter. We have one more chapter, chapter number five. So yeah, we're nearly done with the book. It's, you know, it's been a pretty good book so far. I've enjoyed reading it. Glad, I, glad I picked it up. Thank you for reading it with me. Um, so yeah, uh, if y'all want to tune in, you know, or thank y'all for tuning in. If y'all want to follow me online, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Tumblr, Medium, all of these are Marxist. Hit me up there. Follow me there. Y'all have a great day and do that a gooey.